So my birthday is December 14th, which means that I'm turning 37 this year. And I feel like a lot of the things that I've been thinking about recently is the fact that I've learned so many different things in my 30s than what I learned in my 20s. I feel like in my 20s, you know, I learned a lot about finances and how to take care of my time and how to keep myself balanced as a human being and be my own person and follow my dreams. And I feel like my 30s were so much more surrounded by, you know, being pregnant twice and having kids and all these body changes and a lot of honestly internal and mental growth that really happened during that period. One of the things specifically that I really wanted to talk about in this video is really wanting to connect with people quite differently than I did in my 20s. And so speaking of that, I did want to give a little mention to my sponsor for today's video, which is Hallmark. I'm going to be talking a little bit more about their video greetings later on in the video because I feel like it's like one of the ways that I'm choosing to do like a deeper connection with people but I will get to that when I talk about gifts <laughs> later on in the video but for now let's go ahead and hop right into it. So the first thing that I've learned in my 30s is how to actively listen. I feel like when I was in my 20s and I thought about being a good listener I thought that meant literally just being in the presence of another person speaking and being quiet and listening. I, I, that's all I thought there was to it. And I didn't really think twice about how I would necessarily respond to it because, you know, in my head, I was just responding to the conversation as naturally and as compassionately as I thought I was supposed to. But it wasn't until my 30s that I learned more about how to listen in a way that the person speaking needs to be heard. So instead of thinking about listening from my perspective, it was thinking about listening from their perspective. When they're telling me something, like a story about something that happened in their life, what are they wanting to feel? What are they wanting to hear? And I've just found that a lot of the times, the biggest thing that people want when they're sharing something about themselves is that they want to be validated. So even if they're like complaining about something or telling about a struggle, I think a lot of the things I used to do in the past is I might offer advice on how they could improve or change or or get on a better course to not go through that again whereas now I think a lot of the times what I try to do first is just to say like hey I don't know all the answers but I am here to just listen I'm here for you listening carefully to what they're saying but also being careful not to overly make them feel judged or be critical or try to like advise them too much Sometimes it's okay to be that role for yourself, but when you're being a listener, it's important to be like 100% a good listener. And, and let me just say as a caveat to every single point in this, I'm not saying at this point I'm like an expert at any of these things. It's things that I'm still actively working on, but there are things that have been revealed to me to work on that I think I was kind of oblivious to when I was in my 20s. My second big point is vocalizing how I feel, how something makes me feel in the moment, which is really difficult. In the past, I always wanted to hear about other people's feelings and be there for others. Whereas when it came to myself and the struggles that I was going through, a lot of the times I didn't want to tell people when I was hurting or struggling because I just didn't want to put that burden on people. I felt like I was always like trying to be open and counsel and, and support others. And I really never put myself out there to be heard myself. I ran myself into a corner where I would end up feeling like I would always push my own problems onto the back burner and help everyone else first. And then I would just wear myself thin and, and be really hurt and not know what to do 
because I was so bad at vocalizing how I felt. And I didn't even realize I was doing that until like just literally the last couple of years. So say you're talking to your parent or a sibling or a friend and they say something that maybe they didn't mean for it to hurt you but it just like if you bring it up maybe it'll be awkward for me in the past I would have just kept my mouth shut not said anything thought about it for a month been kind of sad and then maybe if I really trusted that person I would like try to gently bring it up maybe at some point or most of the time just never bring it up. What I have learned is that in trying to, you know, practice saying how something makes me feel in the moment, even though it makes me horribly scared and uncomfortable and anxious, when I do, it seems almost always that the person responds quite gently more compared to what I was expecting and it ends up being really good in the end. Even if sometimes it opens up difficult boxes, as a whole I feel like we're not able to heal from our pain if we're unable to talk about it. The next lesson I've learned is learning other people's love languages and really putting a lot more effort in that. My personal love language is gifts is like the very last thing. It's not that I don't appreciate gifts. It's just that for me, quality time is my number one. For me and Ben, I just love spending all my time with him all the time and having a lot of really deep, meaningful conversations. But when it comes to gifts, I stress a lot when it comes to figuring out what to gift other people. It doesn't just make a lot of sense in my head. However, I feel like especially within the last several months, it's something Ben and I have both been talking about because gifts are both like quite low for both of us. We're realizing a lot of our friends and some of our family members, gifts are one of their highest things with their love languages and so I want to not take that for granted. I want to understand that that is a way that they communicate their love and affection in the same way that quality time means so much to me. Really thinking about it in a way of it not being the actual gift, but how can I make the, the greatest amount of love and thought into the present that when they receive it, they will receive a lot of that thoughtfulness. And I think that shift of mentality really opened my eyes to the importance of gift giving. And so for this one, broadly, I think that the lesson is about embracing other people's love languages. But for me personally, it has a lot to do with gift giving. So I've been trying to just be a lot more thoughtful and picking things out. And actually one of the ways that I'm trying to do that for our family in Kansas is we always send them a Christmas card, but this year we wanted to do something special. So I'm actually going to do a Hallmark video greeting card it is this adorable little penguin card. I know the kids in particular, they just thought this design was so adorable. On the inside, it has a scan code and using the scan code in your smartphone, you can actually record multiple videos, but you can also save photos to it and you don't need a separate app. You literally just need a smartphone and it'll get attached to the scan code so that the person who receives the card can take a picture of it and it'll immediately send them this link to a really special personalized video and like I said you can stack multiple videos so I can just send the code to many different family members and I can do separate videos for like Aria and Ezra and me and Ben and whoever receives this will get them all cut together and they'll be able to keep that video forever and replay it when they miss us, which that's something that's going to stay in their memory for a lot longer than a traditional card. I think it'll be just a really convenient, sweet, thoughtful gift that's going to especially mean so much to Ben's mom because I know how much gifts mean to her. So the next lesson I've learned in my 30s is that more choices does not mean 
better. I'm not saying that I was a maximalist, but I'm definitely someone who had too many things in my 20s. Like, I'm just gonna be honest. I think that where that came from is when I was growing up, I didn't grow up with a ton of money. I didn't have lots and lots of things. I started working as a teenager because I didn't want to like ask my parents to buy me anything like clothes or like if I needed something for school, money for a choir t-shirt, I wanted to just be able to handle that myself and not ask that of them. So by the time I got to college and I had a little more free range over where I would go shopping and what I would do in my free time, I ended up falling into a pretty bad habit of scouring clearance racks and being like quite proud of like, oh, I got this shirt for $5. And then I just realized I had drawerfuls just bursting at the seams and I didn't absolutely love all of those things. And you guys know in the last several years, the whole like KonMari revolution came through where people were really minimizing only keeping things that really spark joy. And I think for me, that was such a revolutionary idea that really changed the way that I had programmed my brain of being like, I need to fill up something missing in my heart that I was previously filling with all of this excess stuff because I felt like, oh, if it's cheap, it's a good deal and I need to buy it. But instead, I really realized there's so much value in only having what you love because then everything that you choose is something that you love. In applying that to parenthood and having children, if we can't get them to like listen or do what we want them to do, is we'll just give them fewer choices. So instead of saying like, you go pick out which shoes you wanna wear because we have to leave, I'll say, okay, do you wanna wear these shoes or these shoes? Do you wanna wear this pair of socks or this pair of socks? Okay, you get to pick out your jammies. Do you wanna wear your monster truck jammies or your Pikachu jammies? I just find that the kids feel a lot more happy and content because they still have the autonomy and the independence to make a decision, but they're not overwhelmed with everything in their whole closet. Like I was always subjecting myself to because I definitely get, uh, what do they call it? Decision paralysis. <laughs> I take the longest time to make a decision. If you take me to the grocery store and if Ben's like, go to the cereal aisle and just grab a cereal, I will like stand there for way longer than I should trying to figure out which cereal is the best cereal to choose. Like, thank goodness he's the main grocery shopper because I'm really bad at it. It's something that I'm working on to just have fewer choices and then not waste all of my time on trying to make choices that don't really matter. <laughs> so this next one is a little bit more specific. It is being really, really honest with my makeup and skincare. Although I think this also applies to fashion. In terms of if something doesn't work for me, I move on. I think a lot of times in my 20s especially, I really held on to this idea that I wanted to present myself in a certain way. I wanted to wear false eyelashes every time I did full glam and I wanted to curl my hair and I wanted to wear my clothes in a certain way and everything had to be so perfect. Starting about a year ago, I made the decision that I wanted to wear false eyelashes less. And part of that was because I wanted to be just more comfortable with like my monolids and my lashes without the false eyelashes. But a lot of that was also because I was actually having irritation on my eyes. I was having an allergic reaction, which sort of forced me to take a step back from having that as my identity. And I really fought against that for a long time. I know I'm wearing false eyelashes today. I don't have the allergy every time now because I haven't been wearing false eyelashes every single day. So now I just wear it once in a while and I'm totally fine. But it's something I definitely struggled with because I made it a part of my identity instead of being more comfortable with more versions of myself. Now I feel a lot more passionate about having many, many different versions of myself to be comfortable in and really feeling like myself when I'm wearing no makeup, when I'm wearing full glam, 
or when I'm just wearing like a daily mono lid, barely any makeup kind of look as well. Like the full range, I feel like I'm a lot more comfortable just being myself and listening to what my body is telling me. So the next point that I learned in my 30s definitely has to do with a firm foundation and brutal honesty. <laughs> when you go through pregnancy, postpartum, especially during the first couple of years of a baby's life, you really get tested in your communication skills. It's funny because I would say that Ben and I in our 20s, we really thought we were like really good at being a married couple. And it wasn't until our 30s that we realized it's not that we didn't go through things that were difficult in our 20s. It's that the things that we went through together in our 30s were way way more difficult like more challenging to our relationship than we had ever experienced before we just hadn't experienced anything like the level of sleep deprivation the level of chaos and and fury and fear and anxiety and just like every extreme emotion all at the same time until we had kids but that also includes like intense joy intense beauty intense love but i think that with that for that to be sustained, you need intense honesty and intense communication. That means really realizing that no matter what we have in terms of like children, how many children, the problems of the children, the problems of the house, the, the mortgage, all of the different things that we're carrying on our shoulders, if we don't have a solid relationship with each other first, if we aren't best friends that are really upfront and honest and really trust each other to be vulnerable and to share things that we're afraid to say and to say it quickly and in the moment or at an agreed upon time later in the same evening, if we don't agree that we are the foundation first, everything else can crumble. That being said, I think that we've had some of our most difficult fights in our 30s, but it's because we face the most challenging things. And I would also say at this point, we're actually closer to each other now than we've ever been and we've been together for 20 years. Me saying that is not just a lesson in my 30s, I really hope that our relationship can continue working on that and continue getting better at that because I don't think it's like, oh, a, a flip just switches and you're like good at communicating. It's a constant thing you have to put in practice. Okay, the next point is having no apologies for being myself. I feel like in my 20s, I still thought a lot about societal expectations when I would look at myself in the mirror. I feel like I was so much more critical of my body, my actions, and how hard I thought I had to work and how over worked and overtired I had to be if I was giving it my all. So let me give you an example with the body image thing. I feel like when you're a teenager and you get bullied a lot, those things hurt and it kind of sticks with you. For me, I got a lot of comments about my acne. I got a lot of comments about my height. I got a lot of comments about my ethnicity, being Asian. They stick with you in your 20s. You think you're being a confident, independent boss woman and just like thinking for yourself and you know making your own way but in the back of your head I would have this thought like oh I could never do that because I'm not tall enough oh I could never do that because I'm a minority. It's not like I meant to, it's just that I was programmed in this way since I was so young that this is how the world is and I should buy into it. Now in my 30s, when it comes to certain things like what society thinks is beautiful, I feel like I'm a lot more comfortable with the idea of saying, no, I get to decide what I think is beautiful. And just because society may have some kind of standard that beautiful people look a certain way, that doesn't mean that's how it has to live rent-free in my brain. Like, I am the one who gets to choose what I believe. And if I want to believe that my mom bod <laughs> is beautiful, I can just believe that. And then the people around me are much more willing to embrace that 
because I'm just living it. So the more comfortable I am in my skin and the more comfortable I am with other people's imperfections and other people's ability to be beautiful outside of societal expectations, the more it'll shift for the people I'm around and the more it'll shift for everyone if we all think for ourselves. Maybe maybe in some ways it's like hard to learn those lessons when you are in your 20s <laughs> because you feel like that's supposed to be when you like take life by the horns. This is like, you're never going to be more beautiful than now. You're never going to be younger than you are right now. But honestly, I feel like I was way happier from like 31 on. <laughs> we have to realize sometimes happiness and living up to societal expectations are two very different trajectories and they don't necessarily meet. Sometimes they might cross. Speaking of thinking for yourself, the next lesson is to trust my gut. I think the biggest thing for me happened again when I had children. I like doing a lot of research. I like being really prepared as much as possible. I like learning from other people's wisdom when I would read about what to do as a parent when it came to co-sleeping or breastfeeding or diaper changing, like every single little thing, I almost always found conflicting information. If you do it this way, then you're a good mom. If you don't do it this way, you're a bad mom. But then I would hear the exact same thing flipped the other way around, saying the exact opposite thing about the other group of people. When it came to actually experiencing motherhood and going on like two hours of sleep and being completely out of my mind bonkers, not being able to process anything in the moment because you know you're trying to keep a little miniature person alive for the first time all of the you're a bad mom if you're a bad mom if it seeps into your brain and you have such a heavy burden of mom guilt because it feels like no matter what decision you make you're always making the wrong decision and we already talked about earlier how i have decision paralysis and it's it's really difficult for me because i put such a high pressure on myself to make the right decision so when it came to motherhood until i took a step back and really said you know what i'm going to take all of the information i've gathered and just do what i want and stop listening to everything else that is the moment motherhood changed for me and became so much more enjoyable. I became so much more confident. I think that can be applied to many things in life, not just motherhood. Your gut, who you are, at the core of your being. You are a person who has things that you care about. You have your sense of right and wrong. You have your inner moral compass that says, this is what I want. This is what I think is right. Unless you're like hurting people, obviously don't hurt people. As long as you're not hurting people, trust your gut and have the confidence that you have the best intent in mind. And it's okay to make mistakes and it's okay to learn from them. You can only learn from mistakes if you have the bravery to make mistakes. Oh my goodness, we got to the last final point. I learned the importance of me time. <laughs> which I feel like it's almost like I want to laugh at myself for even saying that because you know I used to think that if I just like went and got like a massage once every couple of months that's like oh I'm, I'm doing me time but I'm not talking about lavish experiences I'm talking about having a daily ritual where my mind is not focused on work identity or bettering myself or improving something in the household or like how to be a better mom or whatever it is like when that time is just focused on me enjoying something for the sake of it i don't know why that's so foreign and so difficult if you guys relate to that weird feeling of like not quite like doing that or understanding how to do that or if that was you in the past like let me know in the comments because sometimes i feel like when i hear myself saying it it sounds really crazy like why would i not know how to take me time but i think there was a part of my brain that really felt like 
I didn't have self-worth if I wasn't achieving something or I wasn't improving myself or if I wasn't like trying to reach some goal. If it just came down to me spending an hour at night playing a video game or reading a fantasy book, taking care of plants or something, like it just didn't compute in my head before. But I really think in the last year, literally this year, I really learned how important it is to really fully commit to mentally cutting myself off from all of these other identities that I spend doing for the majority of my time. Being a mom, being a wife, a, a person who, who does things on the internet, being a caretaker. I needed to learn how to just be me and find things that were fun for just me and not have uh, any apologies for it because I don't need to apologize for just liking things for the sake of liking it and not being ashamed by it and not being afraid of it and not fe feeling guilty about it. Liking, watching K-pop competition shows, paying attention to variegation in rare plants, liking looking at my little guppies swimming around in their little fish tank, and sometimes I play Sims on the computer. when. It doesn't get me anywhere, but it does make me happy and unplug. So yeah, <laughs> you made it to the very end of the video. Thank you so much for watching. I hope I could impart some of this wisdom to you or maybe relate to some of the lessons that you've learned. If there is a lesson that you feel like you've learned in your 30s that I didn't include, please share what those lessons are in the comments down below. I would love to hear them and I would probably just be laughing and jumping up and down at how much I agree as well. So if you liked this video, please give it a thumbs up. Let me know if you want to see more of these kinds of videos because I had a lot of fun doing this and I guess I will see you guys in my next video. <laughs> love you guys, bye.